and uh, start by saying uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the um, Essential Skills for Navigating Difficult Times. And uh, wow, are we having some difficult times. Um, my name is Lisa Lofman, and for those of you that have not had a chance to meet me yet, um, I would share that I work for the Office of the University Physician, Dr. David Wisemantle, and uh, specifically in two different programs. One is the MSU Employee Assistance Program, which is the Faculty and Staff Counseling Center, uh, where there are five full-time counselors available to support the mental health and emotional health needs of the faculty, staff, support staff, academic staff, graduate student, graduate student employees, retirees, and the spouse and partners and children of those groups. Um, so we get to, get to uh, meet a lot of you and see a lot of you uh, through the work through the Employee Assistance Program. Um, I'm also uh, the lead emotional wellness consultant in the Health for You program, which is the faculty and staff health promotion program. Uh, the two programs are sister programs. Um, and in that role, I go around uh, to units and departments and do training specifically around emotional resilience and psychological flexibility, uh, which is the heart of the skill building uh, conversation that we're going to be having over the next six weeks. Um, the slide that's up right now is just to sort of let you know that I've uh, I've been working on and developing the craft of what I teach uh, for quite some time. I've been a social worker for 31 years, and uh, a great deal of that has been spent uh, as an employee assistance counselor and trainer in corporate settings. I've been doing that since 1994, um, with a few breaks for different, different reasons in there. Um, I've been in my EAP role since 2003 as a counselor and uh, uh, formerly the coordinator of the program and now a counselor and then switching to this emotional uh, 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 resilience trainer role. Um, most recently, uh, the credentials that I've added that have sort of um, uh, increased my skill set is that I'm a certified uh, Daring Way facilitator and a certified Dare Lead facilitator uh, through Brene Brown's uh, training and development. Uh, program. And so you'll be hearing a little bit about the work of Dr. Brown as we go along uh, today too. Um, as we get started, uh, I want to um, just uh, talk about um, the fact that uh, we're, Me Megan and I, Megan, uh, uh, Megan uh, works for MSU Extension uh, in the event services team and Megan and the event services team have been uh, very willing to partner with health for You. In delivering these uh, these webinars, um, the the first webinar series um, that we advertised, which was uh, like th two and a half weeks ago, we advertised it. We advertised it on a Tuesday morning, um, and by Wednesday morning, about 23 hours later, we had 500 people enroll and about 284 people. I love what I say about 280. I say about, and then I'm very specific. About 284 people uh, were on the wait list. Um, and as we launched that class and started to work with the 500 people, uh, we were wondering what to do about the folks because so many people were on the wait list. So we decided to offer this second cohort. Um, and as of uh, just before, 472 folks are enrolled now in the second cohort. So clearly, um, people are feeling like these are skills that, um, that they're interested in learning uh, and they're feeling uh, uh, compelled to do that uh, right now. Um, so Megan and I uh, are new a little bit to the whole Zoom webinar thing. I've done some Zoom classes, but certainly not to this magnitude, and nor using this um, Zoom webinar um, platform. So uh, Dr. Brown uh, uh, recently uh, did a podcast. Her new podcast is called Unlocking Us. Um, and in one of the very first episodes, she refers to something as an FFT. Um, and for this audience, I would call it a flippin' first time. This is the flippin' first time that I've done this. Um, and Megan and I decided to go ahead and do it before we really actually knew exactly how to do it. So we're learning as we go. And as such, we're very open to your feedback um, and, uh, and your grace as we try to figure out how to deliver this content in this format. So even though this is the second cohort, we're still working out how, how we kind of want to do this. Um, sessions. Can I stop you for one minute just because it's getting more persistent? Do you have something that might be open on your screen that would be causing some flashing? Um, is that better? 
it's a blue screen that flashes randomly. I don't, we don't see what it is, but there's, a, it just, it's a little disruptive and I don't want to have anybody have any visual challenges. All right, just um, give me one second. I'd have to stop sharing to see if I can close it. I think it might be worth it just as it continues to be pretty rapidly. I wonder I what it is. I wonder what it is. So I'm, you might close any kind of chats or teams or in our email. I don't I know don't if it's any of those. I don't think anything's open right now. Um, okay. I mean, some documents. Oh, she thinks someone said that they, they think it's when a caller joins. Oh, that's super helpful. Thanks. We've never had that show up before. So what's really cool about that is how, uh, what a great example <laughs> it was about what I was yes. just uh, yes. saying. Is it FFT? So thank you. And, you know, we're going to be learning together how this so goes. Please, please share again and let's try. I've never had that happen before. So thank you. Sorry. So let me just get back where I was here. I do Hopefully. apologize. Don't worry, Megan. Don't worry. We're like, this is, this is true for you and for me. Now I can't figure out how to get my slides back where they were. Uh, it's okay. Like I said, uh, we're just going to keep add it here. Okay. Is my screen showing Megan? Can you hear me, Megan? Yes, you're perfect. You're all good. All right. You're on the right okay. side and everything. Right. Sorry a, about that. That's, a, that's right. It's a perfect example. And and try to, uh, Megan, also uh, model the being uh, sweet with yourself about that uh, as we're just trying to figure this out. Sessions will be recorded um, in part because not everybody could come in the first place. And so some people will probably be watching them only recorded. Um, but also because if you happen to miss or something happens, you have your computer go down, we want you to be able to get the content. Um, so they'll all be recorded. Um, I would love for as many of you to be in the room with us as possible because there will be some dynamic asking of questions and you guys can participate and shape the class as we go. Um, and also, uh, the recordings will be there. I, I, we don't care if you share them with people. So if there's somebody that you think in your world that would benefit from watching them, um, that's just fine uh, with us. Um, it would be great if you can't be at a session that you watch the video before the next class because we are going to build and layer. So each class, I'm going to assume you've seen the ones before. Um, so that's like uh, that's like your on you as a learner because we're going to build week to week and go back to go forward. So I just don't want anybody to be really lost. A uh, part of the um, part of the content flow of this will be we'll have the sessions on Thursday uh, sometime probably before Sunday night you'll get a follow-up email that will include a link to the video and it'll include a, a, a question and answer response from me from whatever questions don't get uh, answered during the webinar. You'll also get uh, a self-reflection worksheet for the following week. Um, there will also be a, a brief survey every week after class. Uh, please take the time to go in and do that because there's gonna be some like poll questions kinds um, the feedback that we get from that's going to also shape the class. So you've got some participati participation, participation, hmm. they got some tasks to do uh, as learners in the class to keep, uh, to keep your learning going. Um, where you're going to find the materials, uh, also there will be a Google folder that's, they're all going to be stored there. So you'll have that link in case you, in case you need to kind of get back to the main folder. So the chat function, how, how that's gonna work this time around, learning from the last time we did it, is the chat's open all the time. Um, it's not open on my screen all the time uh, because um, uh, it, it's, it's too distracting to me and I can't follow uh, my own thinking. Uh, that's a little bit ADD and a little bit too much technology. Um, so what's going to happen is I, when I ask a chat question specifically, I'll open the chat and I'll kind of be paying attention to the chat during that. And then I'm going to close it down and kind of go into presenter mode. Um, and uh, during that time, Megan will still be keeping an eye on the chat, 
but, um, but she's also going to be running the polls and the Q&A and different things and helping me with some stuff. So, um, so if there's something that you need, like a sound issue or something like that, we really want you to put it in the Q&A because that'll pop up differently to Megan and she can take care of that for us. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, when, when I ask you the question, I'm really inviting you to participate. Um, and things that I don't get to because it goes so fast, I, I will review the chat after every class. So that is another way to communicate with me. Um, the Q&A, um, if you have a question along the way, go ahead and shoot it in the Q&A. And then when we get to Q&A time at the end, last 10, last 10 minutes or so, um, Megan will have uh, those sort of tallied and can have do some learning about that. I made this offer to the other cohort too, that if there's somebody in your uh, at-home learning space that you feel like would be an appropriate learner to add, you can pause for a minute and go grab them and ask them if they want to participate. Uh, maybe some of them already are. Um, that's cool. Um, but we don't want that to be a distraction for you. Um, I would really like your focus for this six week webinar to be your own learning. Um, and sometimes we can, uh, when we start having other people around, uh, we get out of our own learning space. So um, if you can keep your own learning focused, uh, both during the class and um, uh, when you're trying on the skills, it's important not to like start naming what you're seeing in the other people. This learning is not about the other people it is about how all humans operate and why having those operating instructions can be so helpful. Um, but for you, uh, you know, we're so good at seeing how we want other people to change. And if they changed and did this, uh, we might feel uh, like life would be easier. Like my, my stay at home situation would be better if this person was less reactive. Um, and so when you're learning, sometimes people want to apply it right away and teach it right away. And I'm going to just caution you just not to do that, just to really let it be your own reflective learning right now, because what I learned the hard way is I can't pass on to somebody else what I don't really deeply know. And so when I dedicated the learning to just seeing how I operate, noticing my own emotional life, my own emotional reactivity, starting to notice uh, how I get caught up in thought stores sometimes and, and sometimes terrorize myself with my own thinking. Uh, being able to notice and interrupt that for myself, um, once I got it and, and understood it, I can't help but teach it to other people because it's just now a worldview that I have um, that, uh, that is so helpful to me. Um, so along that line, I want you to take a minute uh, because if, um, if, if we're uh, very distracted uh, with everything going around, it's really hard to do this. this. This course is going to be, there's information I'll be sharing, uh, and it's also an insight-oriented class. So what's gonna be most important to you about this experience is, you know, what I say is important, and the metaphors I use are helpful to people, and the reset skills are, are important to like even be introduced to. So that's important. And what also is important is what starts to occur to you, new and fresh about you, about the way you approach things, uh, seeing yourself in motion. So it's a very insight oriented class. And if, if, our, if our minds are moving like a moving fan, and, uh, and if, that's, if this is happening to you right now because there's lots of distractions in your environment and you're also sped up with a lot of thinking, like why did I agree to do this? I should be doing 5,000 other things. Yep, da, 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 da. If that's happening for you, not a lot's going to get in. So the invitation right now is to really ask for what you need to make any changes in your external learning environment right now that you need to. Um, is that asking uh, someone else to, to take over some child care and teaching responsibilities? Um, is it shutting the door? Is it closing down some of the other um, uh, windows uh, on your computer? Uh, whatever you need to do to sort of make it the best external environment you can. Look around and just notice, is it good? or is it, as good as, is it as good as it can be? And then I also want you to take a minute to think about your internal learning environment. And what I mean by that is, 
Uh, how uh, preoccupied with other stuff are you right now? And are you willing to, um, I, I, in classes sometimes I say, you know, that I gave everybody uh, an invisible crock pot, right? And if you've got a lot of problems and issues on your mind, things you're working on, uh, different tasks that you were in the middle of before, you, if you could just take that and put it in the crock pot, right? I love crock pots because they do the cooking while you're not looking. And um, it's still percolating over there. I just mixed a coffee pot with a crock pot, but it's, it's doing its thing. Allowing you to just uh, be here fully uh, right now. Uh, we want you to be here now. Even when look, I'm in a room with people instead of this Zoom room, people look like they're present, but they're really not sometimes. And then I don't know about you, but sometimes um, my body gets someplace a good 10 minutes before the rest of me shows up. And so whether it's, um, you know, in some church services, there's like a call to worship or a, a, at, a, at a church I attended for a while, back in the day, there was a woman that would call people to attention uh, by playing piano. And I think it was the best part of that church experience was her playing piano every week. It's just beautiful. And as people became aware that Barb was playing piano, uh, and they brought their attention to Barb, there was this quiet that happened in the room. And then you could actually feel that people were ready to receive. So I just want you to kind of do the equivalent of that. We want to like move out of processing brain and just start to move into receiving mode where you're just going to take in what I have to offer today, get curious about it, wonder about it, if something occurs to you about the thing you put in the crock pot, go ahead and open it and give it a stir, but then, you know, let's come back, right? Well, we'll notice we get distracted. You probably will get distracted. Uh, if you notice you get distracted, we want you just to notice and then just come back and see, because the next thing I say and the next thing that occurs to you about what I say uh, might really be a piece that helps you navigate this whole difficult time a little bit easier. So right now I would like us to take a moment and just start to settle in to a state of mind that best supports our learning. And one of the, one of the visuals for that I have that some of you, I know probably some of you have uh, seen this before. This is my uh, a little uh, home office mud mine jar. Uh, in it I have some glitter and some sand and some rocks. I put rocks in this one because I wanted um, there to be hard, Hard issues in here, thought, you know, thoughts about hard things. Um, but right now, you can see it's pretty clear. And um, if uh, if I was trying to listen to somebody, I could hear. Uh, if I'm offering, I'm actually here right now. I'm feeling pretty settled right now, and I'm I'm just offering you what I know and my wisdom. If if the sand and rocks and glitter in here, which represents different thoughts I could have, if I start having thoughts and then having thoughts and thoughts. Oh, how come not everybody's here? Maybe people don't really want to do this. Oh, uh, you know, uh, um, how long will my hair get over the course of six weeks? And what's that going to look like? And that's a thought I had earlier today. And, um, you know, maybe some thought or concern about something going on. Uh, you know, maybe uh, a thought about President Sammy's email today and what that might mean for me. And, and, uh, and then maybe it's about um, how I'm going to get my provisions tomorrow and get those to the people in my family and fit that in with everything. Like, yep, da 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 oh, If you're there, even just talking about that, making that up, my heart rate came up. So we could have, in, look, as soon as I stopped, it started to settle. And one of the things that uh, I would ask you to begin to notice is what's the quality of your state of mind right now. If somebody is at home trying to talk to you and you're like this, sometimes managers will still try to talk to people when they're like this and they don't take the minute to actually settle and then have the conversation. And those conversations don't go well and they actually take longer than when somebody actually enters the state and brings that to a person, addresses the issue and moves on. So there's a chance that you were a little like this, and maybe some of the things I said got you really like this, but that's okay. If you were here, uh, I would ask you all, what has to happen for this to settle down? 
And if we were in a big room, the first thing people always say is stop shaking it, Lisa. And then I ask, well, what's, what has to happen before I can stop shaking it? Like on this is I'm like on all these thoughts about what's going on in my life right now and what's on my plate and why did I agree to do a second webinar? Didn't I have enough work to do? What was I thinking? I'm you know, um, uh, okay. So for me to have that settle down, what has to happen? I have to stop shaking it. But I can't stop shaking it until I realize that it's me that's shaking it. It's not the webinar. It's not my to do list. It's not uh, the questions that I have about what's happening uh, in our workforce. Um, those things are out there and my state of mind varies moment to moment. So as we start to notice how churned up and busy minded we are, um, we can start to learn how to settle that. So a few of the practice reset, the practical reset skills I wanted to offer are related to noticing and settling. And the, and the reason why that's important is that what I bring, my clarity, my wisdom, when people talk about managers ha sometimes having a knee-jerk reaction, what they're really saying is there was a lot of thought going on and people thought it was a good idea to do A, B, or C. But often, when we take a minute to settle, we can see that A isn't a good idea and C is really not a good idea, so we should probably go with B. But maybe we wouldn't have got there if we hadn't settled. I would ask uh, if we had time, do a poll. How many of you is, have pressed send on an email that you probably shouldn't have sent because you wrote it when you were in a state of mind that was not the best problem solving state of mind you could have acted in? I love that some folks raising hands, that's great. Uh, it's gonna totally fill up my entire screen probably because we've all done it, right? So right now, just so that you can get the most out of this experience, I want to teach you a three breath reset. For me, if I'm in a staff meeting or I'm in a staff meeting and something just didn't go my way, or um, uh, I have a plan and somebody changes my plan and I'm in an upset, if I can notice that three breaths is all it takes typically now that I, now that I, now that it's second nature to me and I, I have developed some um, muscle memory around this, just like a guitar player would develop muscle memory around uh, the fingering. Um, three breath reset is really this. On your first breath, I want you just to take, just put your attention on your breath. Notice your breath coming in. Notice yourself holding your breath at the top, and then just notice your breath coming out on the exhale. Just a. We actually want to exhale fully because part of the problem with our breathing is we don't exhale fully enough, so we can't take new air in. So the first breath, just noticing your breath in, noticing your breath out. On the second breath, I would like you just to notice all the tension in your body, how you're holding your body, and all the whatever's going on in your body, and I'd like you just to kind of gather it up like a bunch of leaves or flowers at the top, and when you exhale, I'd like you to drop them and just take on the position of a more relaxed person. Like let the energy fall into, the, I imagine it falling into the floor and away from me. I told kids to become a wet noodle or a limp noodle, like just, right? First breath, just your breath. Second breath, your tension, right? And on the third breath, what I'd like you to do is uh, just notice your breath coming in. And when you exhale, um, I would like you to place your full beaming attention on the present moment using one of your senses. So if you're like me and you're working someplace where you can look out into a backyard, you might notice the beauty of the daffodils, particularly the ones that survived the snow. And I can notice the leaves gently blowing. I notice leafy green things on this tree outside my window. I'm just uh, now in a more relaxed position. And I'm just noticing, I could notice the light coming in the room and how the window frame is making a neat, a neat uh, pattern on my sofa over there. Cause you know, we're in the, the worldwide headquarters of Spartan resilience training here called my house. Three breaths, breath, tension, 
and then use your sensory experience to connect with the present moment. Often when we're spinning in mud mind, the content of it is either future or past. And, and all of the reset skills are not like designed to like take care of the problem. Uh, and, and for me, resetting isn't the end of the story. That would be like, oh, don't worry, be happy. For me, it's allowing myself to reset my system. It's a reset my physiological system. Um, it clears my my it clears my thought palette, if you will. Uh, I did this because sometimes I think of it like like maybe there's a lot of circumstances raining on my windshield, just like a storm. And these moments of reset are like just the windshield wiper. And so in that moment, I have more clarity. Right. And so I want to get good at knowing when I should turn my wipers on because we're really not all that great at knowing that. So that, that is the first uh, practical reset skill I want you to practice this week. We're going to ask you, I'll, I'll refer to it again in a minute. We're going to ask you next week if you were able to practice that. First breath, noticing your breath. Second breath, your tension and dropping. Your third breath, using one of your senses to come to the present moment. And in case you're wondering, the teaching has already begun. I want you to know that the content of this class is not new and it's not uh, being created just for this uh, time. Um, I've actually been teaching this for a really long time, uh, but I'm trying to frame it related to the current time and the current experience that we're having. Um, and I think it's really important uh, because even without a global pandemic or the Nasser crisis and the leadership transition and challenges that we're having on campus, yeah, our, our campus experience is different than maybe that school down the road uh, because we have, you know, this happening, but it's on top of that other thing that happened. And then on top of some of the other challenges that set us up for that thing. And so, you know, it's true both in our work culture, it's also true in my day-to-day -day life that if I'm living my life right, life is going to be hard sometimes. Life is hard is the very first sentence of Scott Peck's book, uh, A Road Less Travel. Life is hard. Um, it's inevitable that we're going to struggle sometimes. Uh, most of us have our, our difficult emotions uh, and experiences and situations tough to move through. Daunting challenges. We all have daunting challenges. We we have differently daunting challenges, but we all have daunting challenges and um, That's happening all the time The only way to not have heart in your life is to like live so narrowly confined that you're not really living it um, Like if I uh, if I want to have a rich and meaningful life and that includes having a partner I might ask this person out on a date and then I might date them and then I might get dumped and that being dumped is hard but the only way to avoid ever being dumped is to never date, and, and that's gonna keep your life pretty small. So if we're living full, if we're showing up and we're living life, there's gonna be hard moments, and that's true about every aspect of work. We cannot be brave and daring and courageous. We cannot step out. I know there's a lot of development folks involved in this cohort of the class, the external facing MSU employees, and, um, uh, you know, that's been hard, right? Because uh, of what we're trying to deal with. <coughs> so, um, you know, to be brave and show up and represent well when people are gonna bring you heat, right? It's really hard right now to be probably, I'm imagining someone that works in the solution center, right? Because a lot of people have a lot of upset. Um, and so they're gonna be brave and show up every day and, and do that good work. I really appreciate that they're there trying to answer our questions with data that's changing, right? So regardless of how good we are at planning, preparing, uh, hard's gonna show up. Wow, recently has hard showed up. And we're all having a, a similar experience uh, with this global pandemic, like, like across the world, we're having a, a, a shared experience. And we're also having what I would call fingerprint experience. It, mine is unique to me. Mine is different than yours. Um, uh, actually, I think it was Megan that first shared with me a quote this week. Uh, you might have seen it, but it says, uh, we're all in the same boat, but we're not all in the same storm. Uh, and I want to come back and talk about that a little bit. 
um, that we're all navigating and, and many of us have hard, different, very different kinds of hard. The trouble is in our cultural experience, we spend so much time trying to avoid having any hard. That's where our control is. We're gonna to try to rigidly control this so that none of that happens. Again, good planning is a good idea. Like our, our critical incident team, uh, command center, they can do all the things they can do to try to plan and prepare for some kind of a critical incident. Um, but there's likely at some point going to be a critical incident and there's no like getting around that. So we put our emphasis on avoiding the hard rather than focusing on how to best navigate hard when hard happens. So this class is gonna put the emphasis on the navigating. Um, as opposed to the avoiding. That doesn't mean I'm gonna like step out and just you know invite all kinds of hard, but it is gonna mean that I'm gonna be able to check in with my values and decide how I wanna show up as an MSU employee post the pandemic, post Nasser. Um, and, um, uh, and be prepared for the challenges that's gonna come. We need braver leaders and braver leaders have to know how to navigate hard. Because uh, if we're going to keep it all so there's no hard, then that's not very brave. Resilience training in advance of hard happening is always a good idea. Um, I shared with the other cohort that I lost my dad when I was 23. Um, I've uh, recently graduated with my uh, bachelor's degree in social work um, and had no uh, resilience training. Like my degree taught me how to think about mental health but it didn't teach me how to access my own innate health and well-being, And it didn't teach me how innocently I was terrorizing myself with my own imagination and my own thought habits. Um, it was pulling me into a reactive pattern. Um, you know, it's like life happens, drama optional. Back then the drama was not optional because of the way I responded to little things, let alone big things. And I joked with the first cohort that if we could like zoom my siblings in right now, um, and ask them, you know, circa 1983, uh, do you think your sister would ever become a resilience trainer for a Big Ten university? I'm pretty sure they would say, no, that's you know, ridiculous, right? Um, so I was glad between the time my dad passed away and the time my mom passed away when I was 36, uh, I happened to work for an organization that was going through some hard things, and I had the opportunity to learn these skills. And it's, it's been a total life game changer. Prior, um, I had two degrees in social work and was fairly successful by most measures. Um, uh, outwardly appearing, I had some perfectionism, so I was pretty shiny to the world. Um, inside, kind of a hot mess. Inside, uh, anxious, insecure, imposter syndrome, um, a lot of self-loathing. I was very critical of myself. Um, I had some past trauma that I felt like I was just carrying around that I could not get free of. Um, I was just very weighted down and not very nimble um, and not very resilient. Um, and um, had a bunch of diagnoses and uh, um, the way I was coping and medicating that also led to some addictions that, that, I've, that I've had to, to unlearn. Um, uh, and so... I was glad that I learned the skills in between because when my mom passed away, I showed up different. Like when my mom passed away, um, I could deal with the heartbreaking experience of that and also deliver the eulogy at her service and also be the executor of her estate and also um, help her on the day she died, help her say goodbye to her parents and, and help her connect with her niece and nephew um, and take care of the business of like making sure she exited. Uh, okay, that I was not resilient and on 24-7. Um, I remember being being really steady with her in one moment and then walking out in the hallway and being totally overwhelmed by what was going on and being mad that my siblings weren't there. Like, I, I can't handle this, right? I would notice that. I would get settled. I'd come back and do the value-guided thing. I learned how to go from a moment of upset, get my bearings back, connect with my value-guided self, and then come forward with value-guided action. And while we can't control a lot of what's happening related to this pandemic or the economic fallout from the pandemic or the health-related consequences of the pandemic, we can learn skills so that moment to moment we can do that. We can be upset, understandably, get our, know that we have our bearings or we don't. When we don't get our bearings, reconnect with our values, 
touch the compass that tells us we want to go this way. And then without criticizing and judging and being so harsh on ourselves, find the next path forward. That's what this skill set is sort of designed to do for you. So a couple poll questions I just want to know real quick um, is, uh, Megan's going to pull up that poll, is um, uh, have you attended a course taught by me in the past? Just on the poll, uh, just, tell, just go ahead and answer that. I just want to know what percentage of you have had a little bit of this training before or maybe not at all. On the poll, not the chat function. The poll's going for both questions, so you can pop the other one up if you want, Lisa. Okay. All right, that's they're, great. They're I'm both fine. entering at the same time, and I'll right. let you know when we get to that 80 to 90 percent. Okay. The other is, have you heard of the concept of psychological flexibility? Has has somebody sort of talked with you? Like, I know we talk about physical flexibility and if you, know, if you don't use it, you're gonna lose it kind of with your physical body, but has somebody actually spent time talking with you about that related to your psychological process? If you've already answered the poll and you're waiting, go ahead and try on a three breath reset. Breath. Tension, moment. I'm going to close the poll in about five seconds, three seconds, two seconds, one second. Okay. I'm going to share the results so that the group can see and then I'll read you the results. Uh, so have you attended a course uh, taught by Lisa? The 67% is no for okay. this cohort. So a flip from the first cohort, um, which is exciting. Very um, exciting. <laughs> and then have you ever heard of the concept of psychological flexibility? 66% no, 34% yes. So. Okay. All right. So still like two thirds, one third in both of those categories. So. Okay, and that's helpful to me. I'm also super excited because if you have struggled with anxiety um, or you struggled with perfectionism or you've struggled with kind of any psychological kind of depression, you know, any of those, and no one's ever taught to you, talked to you about psychological flexibility, there's a really good chance you're going to have an improvement in your experience of it. And I'm not saying that these skills will like poof, make you not have any biochemical depression. What I would say is like a person that has some bipolar uh, uh, chemistry um, navigates bipolar better with these skills than they do when they have bipolar and they don't have these skills. Um, uh, somebody navigating uh, economic hardship navigates better with these skills than they do without. So um, it's not like a poof, uh, uh, magical thing, um, but it does significantly change our experiences of what's happening. Here's the other thing. I just want you to go ahead and chat. I'm going to open up the chat and I just want you to, you know, bring it like, um, uh, what is one thing you hope? Like, why the heck did you choose to do this? And you can say like, I need a break from my kids. That's cool. Like whatever, whatever you want to say, uh, just go ahead and chat it now. I'd like everybody to chat one hope. Cause I'm going to read them later. Cause I know what I want to teach. I know this, I know the skills. Um, and I know how to, I want to link it to what's happening, but I also want to like be specific to um, this particular cohort. So I'm seeing, I want to have more peace. Coworker recommended. I want to be able to relax. I want to not be on stress. So go so fast. People are struggling. They want a more peaceful mindset. Uh, some, lots of other people sort of suggested it. I'm hopeful that they went to class. Uh, Having less anxiety, better coping. Uh, someone just said that they're pregnant. I was pregnant when I first learned this. I'm pregnant with my old. I'm so glad my kids didn't know me then because I'm so much steadier now. More skills to help yourself navigate. Refresh everything that you learned from before. That's great. Yeah, if you're in the category where you've been before, you're so very welcome to. I, I have been to so many classes where I've just let it, myself hear it all over again. Uh, every time I do that, I, it goes deeper and I see things I didn't see before. Strengthen your emotional intelligence. 
Uh, not punch your spouse, that's a really good idea. In <laughs> uh, the uh, MSU um, Boulder by Design, it says uh, breathtaking outcomes. And some guy told me that the only way he could have a breathtaking outcome was if he throat punched somebody. I'm like, kind of want to work on your stress level. Uh, deal with the wildly unknown and the grief. Yeah. I think that this set of skills will, it can't, wildly unknown. I love that phrase. I'd like to borrow it, whoever said that. Um, and um, uh, uh, and the grief, right? So uh, the skill set that we're talking about today uh, um, uh, is based on a bunch of theories I'll show you in a second. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dip into all of those, but hopefully it'll give you a, um, a road map. Um, um, of, of other learning you can do so that over time you just get more and more skills to navigate. I wouldn't give up any one of the skills that I've gained. Uh, keeping positive and leading our team in the right way. So I hear there's sort of a leadership sort of like uh, kind of rowing the boat in a, in a, in a wise way. Um, yeah, sometimes, all right, so sometimes you, you think you're coping well, but maybe, uh, maybe you're fooling yourself. So we're going to try in this class to like, build some skills, but I'm also going to want to normalize some of what people are experiencing. I think that's really important. Yes, being able to stay in your grounded, centered self while dealing with patients, while helping students, while uh, talking with donors, um, uh, while having to go to a healthcare system and navigate, while needing to go to the Costco. Um, so I'm hoping it has practicality. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you very much for sharing that with me, and I will sit with that uh, later today. I'm closing chat now so that uh, I can access my full brain um, as we go forward here. So, um, okay, it's designed to start you down a learning path. We're not going to get to everything, um, but hopefully it'll help you start to have a frame. So you just shared with me what you're hoping. I'm going to try to incorporate that. Here's what I'm hoping to present. I would like you to learn uh, some basic operating instructions for your emotional guidance system. I like to think of it as an EGS, like your GPS in your car. Imagine this amazing piece of technology, your GPS, right? Um, so I, I imagine most of you have not read your owner's manual on your phone or your GPS. Like if I really knew how to use my, uh, my iPhone to its fullest, uh, things would be really different. I know about this much about my iPhone probably. With a GPS, the most important piece of operating a GPS well is to know that you have to enter the address or the destination you wish to go to, right? Where do I want uh, this thing to take me? But with our emotional guidance system, we don't spend time thinking about what values do I want to come to in my work so that when I'm having a hard time at work, um, I can make sure that I'm lined up with those values and that I'm not like coming off sideways in a way that's not who I want to be. So part of this class is going to be figuring out how you want to show up and be seen and live brave in the different areas of your life, uh, what values you really want to use to kind of light the way and, and keep your path clear. Um, for me, I'll give you an example of this I did not share with the other cohort, um, but the very first week when we came home, I'm an EAP counselor, I had a full caseload, uh, all my classes got canceled, so I had a little bit of space on my calendar from that. But I was also like a little stunned myself. I didn't really have my own bearings completely. Uh, my wife uh, went uh, uh, to shelter in place up north because my daughter, uh, who has been in college and then stayed in California after college, uh, on March 11th, she came home from California, from Orange County. So for safety purposes, we sent uh, uh, my, my slightly older uh, wife up north and my daughter came home. So I was separated from my wife. My daughter's here now, which was great. My son's, both my son's in transition. That first week was really about like, what? And trying to get organized. And in that, um, I kind of was like, well, you know, I feel like I should be doing something to be helpful to people. And, and really, I was like, I could, maybe I could create a class. And then I was like, or I could just take a nap, right? And I just was kind of spinning. Late towards the end of that week, I, I, I agreed to do a training for another group of people. And I'm so glad I did that because when I did that training, it like reminded me that I do have a unique contribution to make. 
And it also reminded me that my core values related to work this year, my chosen values, are curiosity, um, uh, creativity, and courage. Like those are the three words that I come back to uh, to help me find my way. Um, and so when I got and thought about those values, like, okay, if you want to be lined up with your values, even though all this happened, what would you do? And that's when uh, I had a conversation with Megan and uh, I was trying to, I, I, in a conversation I said, like, I'm trying to figure out what's uniquely mine to contribute. Megan said she would help and uh, two different webinars, close to a thousand people, plus a hundred, like not a hundred, but probably 20 now other webinars. We're talking now having uh, touches and trying to teach to, you know, at this point, thousands of people just in the last few weeks. And the thing that's really important about that is that as I've done that, um, my own energy flow, like when I'm grounded, connected to my health and well-being, and bringing that energy out, uh, in a value guided way, I don't lose my energy. I'm working harder than I normally do right now. Um, but as I give that energy, energy comes through. And so I actually have traction and um, sort of a circuit. I'm saying that, and I don't want anyone to hear that and to start judging themselves. Oh, I should be doing what Lisa's doing. And why am I not? Blah, 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 blah. You know, the trauma that we're experiencing, um, if you really are still in that early stage of like just functionally trying to get by, that's also to be expected. Um, and so, you know, as we do some learning, you might see how to have some more energy and in, in a value guided experience with that that feels good to you. Um, you're also gonna have to deal with grief and trauma depending on what your experience looks like. So I don't want anyone to, to hear that and, 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 and take the productivity pill uh, and the pressure and the perf perfectionistic stuff. No. I'm not doing the things I'm doing out of a sense of perfectionism, which by the way, perfectionism is not about performance. It's about managing people's perception of your performance. Um, this really feels heartfelt, value guided, and about the actual work. Um, and that's what's important. When your guidance system is turned on, you get so much good data about whether you're on course or not with who you want to be. Um, and just like when I'm driving down the road and maybe I drift because I'm tired or whatever and I hit the rumble strips and it wakes me up, uh, when that happens, what do you do? Like you go, oh, and then you just gently self-correct. You don't like go, I can't believe how stupid I am. Like that'd be dangerous. You just go, oh, and you make a slight modification and then you continue down the road. And then you maybe say, maybe I need some coffee or maybe somebody else should drive or maybe I should stop fiddling with whatever I was fiddling with right? Very useful recognition and data. That's what we're looking for here. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you a six-word framework that I would like to have on, you know, on billboards, on parking ramps that are as big as those other signs used to be a few years ago. Um, these six words are going to go over and over and over because I want you to get them committed to memory in the order that they are because, um, I guess, probably the best thing I've ever created other than my children, right? This this scaffolding, this framework to help people move from, oh my God, upset, are you kidding me, to uh, a way to get grounded and a way to move forward. So I'm gonna share that with you even today, hopefully, uh, unless we run out of time. Um, and then there'll be throughout the time, these practical reset skills to help you steady yourself and center yourself as you move through your day. So in the second class where we're, we've only had two classes, there's already been five reset skills that I've taught during that. Um, it is uh, really important in the work that I do that the emotional resilience piece gets set aside next to social justice, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work um, so that um, we're really understanding fully, um, like, for example, that we are all in the same boat, but we're not in the same storm uh, because some of us are ex experience health inequities, meaning that uh, there's differences between maybe the kind of care I get versus the kind of care uh, a person of color gets. Um, those differences are systemic and unnecessary and avoidable, um, and we could change them. But for example, uh, the the failing of the healthcare system right now um, is connected to racism. If you pull back and look at it, um, and so while we're talking about this situation, we want to actually see the bigger context. Um, that's true about things like the healthcare system. Um, it's also true with what your experience might be like uh, trying to navigate campus um, because um, 
I have barriers that present to me that don't present to people who are heterosexual or straight identified uh, because of my LBGT identity. Uh, I've run into barriers like that. I've had people who don't want their kids to see me in counseling because of that. Like, it's not neutral. It's not the same. Um, and the more social identities that you have where you are in the targeted group, which means sometimes by the system and the institution treated as less than and not given as much power and access, um, the more of those you have, the more difficult your load is. And so sometimes when people are struggling with that, a mental health provider will say that's depression, this person's depressed. And I'm like, well, no, or maybe they're oppressed. Or maybe we need to look at the both end of that. So sometimes people get confused by my saying those things because it makes it sound like I am saying it's the circumstances. And what I would say is that the system, we need to understand and have critical awareness about what's happening for us based on those differences. Whether I'm in the privileged group or not, when if I'm in the targeted group, um, uh, I need to understand that uh, because that's part of what I'm trying to navigate. And sometimes rem being reminded that that was a microaggression helps me pull out, out of my shame. When somebody shames me to, as a woman to get me to not use my voice, um, if I don't see that and I'm shame triggered, I'm just stuck in that experience. But if I can start to see that that happened, now it's out here and I can start to have new ideas about it and I can start to come up with get my values and come up with a different plan for addressing. So part of the model is that we're going to be, um, you know, speaking to uh, how uh, power and privilege impacts people differently depending on your social identities and um, how the system favors or doesn't favor you across that. And I'm, I have a very intersectional frame of that um, where I think that, uh, you know, our differences layer up and can make different challenges sometimes talk more about that as we go along. And the final learning objective is to really get clear. Um, I know some of the folks in the Friday cohort are like needing this to be sooner. It's sort of set towards the end of the class to really get clear about doing some value clarification and identification. There'll be some homework related to that so that you can really start setting your compass. Um, for me, in the past few years, uh, my values related to work were caring, contribution, and connection. And every day when I go to campus, and actually right now every day because I walk at night on campus now because you're all not there, so I can be. <laughs> um, uh, I stop by Beaumont Tower and do a three breath reset. And on that third breath, I think about my values and then I think about what I want to bring to the community. Uh, and that helps me go in the office in the morning connected to my values rather than upset about something that happened at the staff meeting. Right? I go in with perspective rather than my ego, uh, and that's super useful and helpful. So something I'd like to really uh, uh, say is that through this experience, um, I hope that we can get better at naming our emotions and making space to feel our emotions because what we really need to do with our emotions is to slow down, feel them, and release them. Because uh, our emotions are, are designed to like give us information which if we're not willing to feel the emotion, we don't get any of the information. I remember telling a helper once that I wanted to be free of anxiety and her name's Mavis. And Mavis said, well, Lisa, well, why would you want to go and full, do a full thing like that? She said, that'd be like losing your ability to shiver. How would you know when you were cold? And I was like, what? Right, Cause I only saw anxiety as a negative thing to be avoided at all costs or to be controlled. Um, she's like, yeah, anxiety sometimes tells you that things aren't, that things aren't, that something's not okay. If you're curious about it, if you just see it as, oh, I'm feeling anxious, like what's, huh, like looking at it like that as opposed to being in your anxiety and making up a story about it. And I remember after she said that to me, the first time I noticed what she meant, like the, the moment the penny dropped about that, was I was sleepless one night uh, and just feeling really anxious. And instead of like being anxious about being anxious or being anxious about not sleeping, I just got curious and I kind of said out loud to myself, uh, Okay, okay, anxiety, what are you trying to tell me? And this is like post 9-11. Uh, I had a private business uh, at the time of 9-11. Uh, my mom was also terminally ill and struggling. Um, one grant ended. Uh, we didn't have the next business grant set up, so we were starting to have economic strain. I was in denial about that. I didn't want to see it. 
Um, and when I asked my anxiety that night what it was trying to tell me, it actually said to me, get a job, like an organizationally supported job. Uh, it's like, you know, and I know, you know, could I know you don't want to quit working with your business partner, but you need to get an organizationally supported job. Uh, and, you know, ultimately that led to me standing here because that was the year uh, I started to kind of leave my private wor work world and come back and I ultimately ended up with this job. Um, so, I'm not entirely sure why I just told you all that story. Emotions, we're going to slow down, feel, learn, and release. And so what I'd like you to do right now, just on a piece of paper or your phone, whatever, is just reflect for a few minutes on all the emotions that you've had in the past few weeks. Just, um, just go ahead and, and do a brainstorm of that. Jot them down as fully as you can. Give me just a couple more moments. Now go back at that list and circle if you can or indicate in some way uh, which ones um, are which one feels the most prevalent to you. Like what, what's the one or two that just really seem like if I had to say this is what I've been predominantly feeling, what is that? Okay. If we were in a room together, I would be asking you some more questions about this, but what I will share is sort of my, my guess about what's on your paper. So when I ask people to do this, usually they write them on index cards and I end up with them. So I got, have gotten to see a lot of people's index cards. Um, and normally, uh, typically what I see is people have somewhere between five and 10 words written down. If you were to count them, my guess is that a majority of your words are um, heavier, or uh, they're necessary emotions. So I never use good or bad. I don't think there's a good or bad emotion. They're just emotions. Just like there's no good or bad piano keys, there's just lighter, brighter ones, and then there's the heavier, uh, lower ones. Um, and if you only had half of the keyboard, our, mu our the richness of our music would be so much less. The same is true about our life when we only let our have self have certain emotions and some of us are doing like emotional chop dun 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 because we, we don't have a very big range. Um, Brene Brown's new book's going to be about emotions and emotional um, uh, literacy. Uh, she thinks it would be helpful for all of us to have, be able to name like 40 to 45 emotions. Um, so my guess is you have about 10. My guess is more of them are the heavier uh, challenging emotions. Uh, grief, uh, shame, frustration, irritation, insecurity, uh, anger, those kinds of things. You probably also have some joy and some other things on there. I'm kind of curious because one of the things I'll show you is that in the past few weeks, I think more people have more of those lighter, brighter, meaningful, like value-guided emotions happening. What I want to do right now is show you some word clouds that I've been collecting from different groups of MSU employee, different employee groups. Uh, and I really just want you to take in the, the, the emotions because th they answered the same question. So if I got all yours and could instantly do a word cloud, yours might look like one of these. But So I just want you to experience them because this idea that we should not bring emotions in the workplace is ridiculous because um, we do. Like I'm never uh, separated from my emotional field. Um, I may be grounded and peaceful and, and having um, really heartfelt emotions at work, or I may be angry and frustrated and about to lose my ever-loving mind, but I'm never without emotions. It's like the most dangerous myth in workplace uh, uh, development, culture, work, uh, this idea that you should be able to leave your emotions at the door. No. What we need to do is be better and more responsible and more accountable for having healthy emotional uh, processing. Um, so here's, here's the things. The question I'm going to ask you at the end, so I want you to do two things. One is just take them in. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds on each of these slides. Just notice them. And then at the end, I'm also curious if, if you had them all laid out, do you feel like you would be able to pick out the group that's the faculty, pick out the one that's executive leadership? Could you pick out the undergraduate students? 
Could you pick out the academic advisors? Could you pick out the support staff? Right, so here they go. Words that are bigger are the ones that got said more in that group. This is 100 MSU employees from across the state. In all of these slides, if I were to go back, when you look at them, they're not just the difficult, necessary, heavy emotions. All of them have uh, empathy, a joy, joys up here, um, calm, peace, gratitude, happy. They all have them all, but individually and collectively, the ones we notice are the heavy ones. And the ones we struggle with are the heavy ones. And partly why this is an important conversation is that without having uh, the balance, without noticing both, our experience gets tipped towards stress and tension and upset. And, and when we're not even looking to have the other ones, there's no corresponding balance. And so we end up TMJ, it's like we end up physiologically assuming the position of anxiety. Uh, as opposed to balancing that out with uh, joy or peace or those kinds of things. So the poll question for you that Megan's going to pull up right now is, when looking at these word clouds, do you think you could identify which one represents faculty from staff to academic advisors? Just really quickly. While you're doing that, I'll show you my mug that my wife bought me because I say this all the time. If I don't get to know, it's okay not to know. Sometimes I need to remind myself of that. I don't get to know so many things right now. I can be okay while not knowing. Can okay, I stay while not knowing? I can connect with my kids while I don't know. What's that poll going, Megan? I'm going to give it about four more seconds, and I'm going to go ahead and close it. Thank you. And then I'm going to go ahead and share the results. And you're at 86% no, 15% yes. So um, I kind of want, if you're in the 15%, because Megan and I were joking about this, uh, and you, and you want to try, send me an email, and I'll send you the word clouds, and I'm really curious. <laughs> um, uh, uh, kind of want to have a prize for somebody if they can get them all right. Uh, I'm serious about that because um, because of something I'll say in just a minute. But the most recent word cloud I did looks a little different. This is uh, post the uh, stay at home order. That's a group of people that I did some training with in a leadership academy. And you know, I would ask you what jumps out is that gratitude. And if actually grateful and gratitude were coded the same way as like the same emotion. Gratitude would be even bigger. Um, anxious and anxiety would be bigger too. But, uh, but still, um, the, uh, there's more balance in this one. And I do think that that's one of the things about this time, if we notice that when we notice um, the preciousness uh, of life, uh, that, that sometimes people are not staying in resistance and resentment about things that don't matter. Um, and so they're actually having, I know one couple um, where if I had asked them two weeks ago or a month ago, if, if, you got, if you had to get locked in your house with just the two of you and your two kids, how's that going to go? They would have said, not well. Actually, they did. They joked about that. They said that we would have told you it was going to be really bad. But they've do, they're doing some of this learning and they're witnessing themselves and they've got their value set on having good energy. And they're having a really, I mean, with the exception of the, the other challenges, there's just a sweetness and a connectedness and a preciousness 
that's balancing out the fact that he still has to go work uh, someplace and, and he's in, at risk every day. Um, and they've got, you know, they've got lots of challenges in their world uh, related to, you know, the health status of their kids and who else is at risk. So it's not easy, but it's grounded in part because there's some more emotional balance. So here's why I think it's important to ask the question and why it took some full time to do that, because I really have a big Spartan dream. And it's like, what if everyone who came to MSU, whether to come here to work or to lead here or to study here, what if we all had the same skills? Because often I see like the, the manager doesn't have emotional resilience and the staff person doesn't have emotional resilience. And, and that's happening and then like the manager also has power. So that's a whole, that's like power and privilege. Like that's not, it's not the same, right? Uh, in the first place, uh, all the way up the chain. And we, we've had emotionally reactive leaders in the past that cast quite a shadow. Um, and so while I've been spending all of my time talking with support staff folks through the Breaking Free From Stress class and the Sustainable High Performance class through my long-term partnership with organizational and professional development, some of the folks who weren't getting that information were the executive leaders and, and up. Um, other people who aren't getting this education are like the incoming freshmen because that's not where I focus. So what if the skills were, like if the skills were taught to the incoming freshmen who have anxiety, has, has surpassed, surpassed depression as the number one concern of college students, that's only gonna be more uh, uh, beyond this pandemic. Um, and so what if everybody, like this is like, this is the thing. What if the same set of skills were taught to every Spartan everywhere in a variety of formats over time with, re, with um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, redund I want to say redundancy, but like, you know, repetitively uh, so that people could get it really ingrained. I actually think it would be a game changer. I really do. Um, so curious what's happening with the chat, but I'm going to just stay here and, and uh, kind of come back to that. So uh, the, the two human capacities that I want to just leave you with, and and uh, and then we'll have to come back. Uh, um, I didn't get as far with this conversation as I did with the first cohort, um, but that's okay. We're going to use the time we have and teach to where we want to go. So I want to like leave you a little bit with the emotional resilience and psychological flexibility. Like, what are those things? So emotional resilience is um, not, uh, everybody has the capacity for resilience. Um, it's not something that you're either born with or you're not, like you either have it or you don't. We all have innate uh, mental health and well-being, uh, but some of us weren't taught to know that, or we were told that because something happened to us early on or in our childhood or whatever, that somehow we lost that, like we're broken or somehow damaged. Um, this, this training is really based on, on the foundation that we all have innate health and well-being. And that when I'm not caught up in my thinking, having a reaction, and when I'm uh, settled in, the, in my, def my default setting is actually my health and well-being. Like when I'm uh, engaged in something and I come to the present moment, like I'm baking or something and, I, and my mind quiets, that I actually fall into a place where I have these kinds of words, uh, compassion, creativity, curiosity, courage, calm, clarity, Right, that we that if we're helped to see how we can come back to this place, this innate mental health and well-being, this source of a new idea, this wisdom, this grace. Um, lots of we could, lots of people call that energy uh, different things, and we'll explore that a little bit in the future in a future class. But to know right now that you have you have that you have well-being, you have a well of being that emanates from you. When I'm grounded and at my best, I can't stop that; it just emanates. And just shine bright. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Hide it under a bushel of thought. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? I'm not sure I've ever sang that at a web, in a webinar before. Emotional resilience is the skill set that allows you to access that when you need it or want it. That kind of like health on demand. Like I can sort of see that I'm here and I can know a good idea needs. So if I know how to settle and invite that energy to help me, I'm going to have more creativity and more wisdom. So instead of uh, something happening and me being resisting and resenting and staying like that for like 40 minutes, if I, as soon as I see that I'm there, if I have the skills to release it, 
then I'm going to fall back into my health and well-being and what comes next can be very different than what just happened. Uh, resilience is the capacity of a system or enterprise or person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. We want to have resilience as we navigate this pandemic, this dramatically changed circumstances. If core purpose, that's our values, if we don't, if we aren't clear about our core purpose, like I always say, if I can figure out what's in the best interest of my children, I can do it even if it's really, really hard. Like back in the day when I realized for a lot of different reasons, it would be best for my daughter to exit the public schools and go to a boarding school. And even though that was economically like really hard, um, I could do it. I was committed to that. And I had to stay committed to it for four years, although I only made a commitment one year at a time. <laughs> my, you know, I, I was able to sustain it because I kept coming back, kept getting clear. And some nights I'd be like uh, so upset because I had to like charge toilet paper, right? Uh, and, and then I would, even, in the, even in the Kroger line, even while I'm there going, I, can't, I just can't do this, I shouldn't do this, why would I blah, 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 blah. I'd be like, often because the, the woman that ran the Kroger self checkout lane at night in Okemos was super nice and would say hi to me and I would connect with her and I would start to quiet down. And while I was ringing it up, I would typically have some new idea about how I might generate some more revenue or offer a new class or get, get a different gig or make coffee and sell it. Like all kinds of ideas came to me that allowed me to navigate that. Resilience is the speed and the strength of our response to adversity, right? Now that's a good sentence that I highly recommend provided your speed isn't because you're trying to bypass emotions. Oh, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, if you can have the strength and the speed of your response to adversity include that you're honoring and releasing your emotions, that you're not stockpiling or deflecting your emotions or numbing your emotions, none of that's helpful. Down the road, you're going to pay the cost if you're stockpiling. All the research is indicating that. So if we can add to that the emotional expression of it, then rock on, I'm with you. Um, psychological flexibility, just as an overview, is your ability to be in the present moment, open up, and do what matters. The opposite of that would be what then? I'm not in the present moment. I'm either in the past or the future. Um, I'm kinked up and struggling and having a difficult time. Therefore, my flow is not happening very well. And because of that, I'm not doing what matters most. I'm spinning or upset. The, the metaphor that we'll talk about more is like that we operate a lot like a garden hose. I, I'm going to call you all a bunch of hoses. Like you operate a lot like a garden hose. I know that's weird. But if you think of like a garden hose, like the point of a garden hose is to be the vessel through which water flows from the spigot to whatever you want to be watering. When we're relaxed and at our best, we have full flow and we can water what matters. I can water, I can say, this is what I want to use my energy for today. This is, and this is why that makes sense. And this is why I'm going to let this other thing go because my wisdom is saying water this now. I'm relaxed and I'm watering. Emotional resilience, psychological flexibility. When I'm kinked up and struggling and I don't know how I operate, I'm going to think that that kink is about something other than me and so that I can't, I don't have permission. I don't know how to like release it until that thing changes. We don't, we don't want to think that the condition of our hose is about the situation. We want to say, yes, those situations are pretty daunting. Um, and if I can notice and relax that kink and get connected to the flow and then ask myself how I want to water it, that's going to work out better. So we're going to go through some skill building around being able to notice when you're kinked Right, because if, if you were washing your car today, uh, I guess right now you could, because it's probably, whether we could do that 10 seconds ago in Michigan, maybe not, but it, let's say it's, you know, 70 degrees and you're washing your car. If the water stops, is that, a, is that a problem? Like, what's your first thought if the water stops? Typically, there's a kink in the hose. Is that a problem? Only if you're already in a bad mood. If not, you go, you find the kink, you open the hose, and the water comes back and you continue to water. No big deal, right? Uh, do you ever think that the car caused the kink? No. 
Like the car is there and maybe super dirty and needing a lot of care, but it doesn't stop your flow. Shifting that, like racism is a big deal. Uh, um, unemployment is a big deal. Um, uh, you know, having the virus is a big deal. And I want to be as psychologically flexible while trying to get over that because if I'm caught up and reactive, I'm not going to be on energy saver mode and I'm not going to be navigating that in an effective way. And I will be more at risk with any of those things if I'm operating from that vantage point. The opposite of psychological flexibility is psychological rigidity. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip this part for now. Uh, based, uh, I'll come back to this later. Um, uh, two sentence summary just to go with is we want to try to have, you know, us go to a place where we're like just naming and acknowledging it is what it is. Given that it is what it is, who do I want to be and how do I want to move forward? It's the second sentence that's so powerful there, right? It is what it is. Notice I just bowed to that. I'm going to bow to what is. It is what it is. Given that it is what it is, who do I want to be? How do I want to move forward? What makes the next best sense? What's the next, uh, what's, what, what three things can I do that might make this uh, better or more where I want to go? We're going to try to be uh, uh, change, you know, this is very much a change oriented strategy. Um, we just want to be changing it from our wisdom uh, rather than shut down from the upset of it. This is the six word framework. I'm going to share this and then I'm going to open it up for questions and I will give you uh, an example of this uh, as we go. Acknowledge, honor, release, relax, reflect, resolve. The other day, I was at Costco and got a text that told me that I was supposed to be on a webinar as the guest. 60 people. I was not happy. I was not happy to be in Costco in the first place, and I was also not happy that I let people down, and I was just totally spinning, shame triggered. It just wasn't a good moment. Plus, I didn't have my pen, so I couldn't, you know, think <laughs> without my pen at Costco. All right, when I'm in that, I'm shaming, I'm yelling at myself. I'm just the opposite of a resilient strainer in the moment. Within about a couple minutes, I could see that that was happening. I also could see that, like, I, I was going to not be able to navigate the Costco very well. This is what happened. I acknowledged it. You made a mistake. You let people down. You're probably going to need to fix that. You're feeling a bunch of things. Your ears are ringing. I even my, like, just remembering it made me stressed again. Your heart's racing. You're, you're shame triggered. Let's just take a breath. I'm just going to let myself acknowledge and honor that feeling. And then I want to be willing in, to, to release it. So I kind of imagined it just all that energy is going all over the Costco. Luckily, people had protective gear on. Maybe they didn't catch it. In that moment, with my hand on my cart, I did a three breath reset. And then I said to myself, what can you do to keep yourself as safe as you can and get this done? And then my wisdom told me I did the best I could with Costco. And then I came home and resolved to take care of it the best I could, given that I made the mistake. Acknowledge what happened. Honor the emotions you're feeling about it. That might be honoring like I need to say it out loud or I need to just give myself a minute to feel it. Uh, I might uh, need to physiologically express something, hopefully not in a reactive way. I might have to do a ball slam or go, go outside and go for a walk to like physiologically release that. It's sort of like honoring your physiological experience and being willing then to like jettison the energy of it. So I say it something like this, acknowledge, honor, release, so that you can relax back into your health and well-being. Connect with your value compass and resolve to take whatever that value-guided voice in your head says. We will go over this more and more. The, the reset, uh, you'll have this to look at this week, uh, and I'll talk more about it next time. The, the uh, go, uh, Acknowledge and honor and release, bow to the experience, become willing to release the energy. Please, you're not releasing your care for the issue. That would be bad. You're just releasing the energy that you're holding, again, back to the uh, windshield wiper, so that you can loosen your grip on it right now, so that you can get reconnected. And then please do care about some of those experiences, because you're going to have to fix the problem. Like, 
whatever it is. Relax into your deepest wisest self, and then what matters most, and then take that action. Uh, this is where the reset skills come in. If you skip to relax, reflect, resolve too fast, you're probably going to be tone deaf. Our institution, after the Nasser sentencing hearings, the leadership at the time, went to relax, reflect, resolve. Let's, let's, let's just move forward. Let's take care of things. Let's move on from here. And people had a bad reaction because we didn't take the time to acknowledge the pain and suffering of not just the survivors, but of faculty and staff who had not been treated uh, well along the way. We didn't acknowledge and honor the pain and then release it. When we did that more fully, we healed, we we're healing better with that full range. So we just don't want, uh, you know, relax, reflex, resolve is like, okay, I'm relax, reflect, resolve. Um, the part that was missing in my thinking about that was honoring the emotions of it. So I'm going to leave this here for now and then ask Megan to um, uh, tell me if there's questions and answers out there. I mean, questions, I may have the answers. So yes. So the first two, um, I love our extension group. Um, there's a question about the recordings and the materials. Are they allowed to be shared with others that they think that they're interacting with that it might be helpful? I know that you were working on some postings on the Healthy For You site, so I thought you might be able to share some of that. Yeah, in the meantime, if there's somebody around you that you want to share the video with, I don't care if you watch it together. Um, I, I, I think I'm deciding that I don't want the PowerPoint slides all over the place, but the, the videos, feel free to share. Um, what we're going to do is get those onto YouTube so it'll be easier to share and we'll also count the number of views, um, which I think might generate more interest in this training being developed on campus. So uh, feel free to share the video links as they happen. Um, and any material that you want to share from the Google folder, like the, the, the self-reflective worksheets, I don't care about that either. This to me feels like trying to help people breathe better. I say that knowing it's a respiratory virus that we're all dealing with. And also uh, really, but uh, you know, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter, I can't breathe becomes, we can't breathe because of the systemic issues. Um, this is really about helping people psychologically and emotionally get their bearings and breathe. And I think we should try to help people have those skills to do that. The next question uh, is, if you have someone on your team who is very muddy, what is an appropriate way to get them to calm down, refocus, if they haven't had this training? From my experiences in the past, having people say calm down doesn't make me feel anything but more angry. Right. How, how do I help? Like, so how do they help themselves? How do they help others? So first thing, Keep this learning a priority for you. Uh, try not to go towards fixing for other people first. Really get it in your bones. Uh, because then what I would say is if you have a coworker who tends to spend a lot of time in mud mine, um, the time to uh, talk about that is when they're not in mud mine. And you know, you can make one of these, you can like I do better when I talk to people about what I am learning. You'll notice that I do a I don't talk about you all. I use myself as an example. I'm trying to show you how it works and I'm trying to show you that everybody does it. And so having a conversation about this uh, with somebody when they're not in an upset, I don't know, 30, 30 years into this for me, if I'm actively in an upset and someone tells me to calm down, I'm likely to tell them to two words and they're not let, let's dance, right? Like I'm likely to just, because I, I have to see it. So if I've had conversations, all my kids know this, and my, and my kids, now that we all know, my kids can, my, my son can go, ma, we got to clean the house, but we don't got to clean the house, right? And he, he teaches me back and I'm like, ah, oh, I see it. Okay, you're right. And because I have a good relationship and we all have the knowledge and we all do it and we all admit it, that's fair. But if you're learning this and you're just going to call somebody on their mud mine, they're going to tell you to take a leap. So talk about it with what you're learning, share an example when you were in mud mine and how you got clear, that sharing's more helpful and you gotta do it not in the red hot moment. The next question is, what is an appropriate way to encourage someone to register for this class within my team without offending them? Again, uh, take it first, uh, um, learn it for yourself. 
and in your team meetings be sharing what you got out of it and how it changes your life. Um, I, be careful of what I call the green pea phenomenon because my co-trainer Millie used to say, like if you come up to somebody and say, oh my God, you got to try these green peas. They're the best green peas on the planet. They are so awesome. You're going to love them. Just try them, try them, try them. I'd be like, take your peas and stick them where the sun don't shine because I don't want your peas. You scare me with your peas, right? But if I'm just sort of enjoying them and talking about my benefit of them uh, in a more relaxed way, people gravitate. There will be people you try to get to see this that will not be into it, but if you genuinely connect with living your life, vantage point, people will get curious, particularly if you're a person that gets reactive now, as you learn these skills and you start uh, getting the good outcome without going through the detour of upset, or, you're, or you detour less time, like when it used to take you half an hour to find your bearings, now it's 30 seconds, people are gonna get curious. I hear it over and over and over. And how one person taking it into their own life and changing how they interact can change a whole family system or a whole work team system over time, but not if you think you're only okay if you get them to see it. That's not going to help. There was a comment added to the um, chat to us that I thought was appropriate. Um, inviting it for all staff, not just someone that you think is specifically needing it. Um, yes, it, it can only compound. Yeah, unless you're having a conversation with that person and you have permission and it's not an upset and you're talking about it just more generally. But first of all, like this is the t this is a thing. You're already thinking about passing it on and we've just scratched the surface here of what we want you to be learning. And if everything I'm saying to you, um, you already know, uh, first of all, that's cool. We should have lunch. Um, but the way I say it and the way I talk about it and the way the skills are is, is, um, is, is it ends up in a package that you can share it because you can talk about mud mine generally. Um, and some of these, like it makes what's invisible visible. Like I want you to be this week noticing your mud mind and noticing what happens when you notice your mud mind. Particularly, I would like you to notice your mud mind. And if you're spinning, I would like you to try on a three breath reset. And that is your homework for this week is to try on your three breath reset. And then when you're clearer, feel free to ask yourself what you should do about the situation. Acknowledge, honor, acknowledge the mud mine, honor, release, relax, reflect, resolve. It's 5.02, we need to stop for here. Um, uh, you'll get a survey. We really want your feedback. We will incorporate your feedback. Your feedback matters to us. Um, thank you for joining. Try to join in person if you can. If you can't, keep up with the recordings. If you have questions, shoot them to me, Lothman, L-A-U-G-H-M-A-N, at msu.edu. And we will add the additional questions that didn't get answered to a Q&A that she will post um, sometime before the next class for you to review. Thank you. Take care, everybody.